the uh, U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum that make, uh, um, again, there's a, a wall, in this case it's not only of faces, but of different, uh, uh, of different, uh, there's a lot of uh, advertisements, sorry about that, um, of different uh, uh, pictures uh, that uh, actually um, represent families of uh, uh, a Lithuanian town um, and uh, uh, again, here the victims are not seen as, as numbers, but the uh, story represented in an augmented way through smartphones and uh, it's in, uh, the interesting narrative to see the, the music. Okay, then I can maybe share also with you the. I see that it's already served, so we can we can go on. In any case, it's really accessible on online. Uh, okay, so I guess also this create a certain kind of uh, um, learning opportunity. The use of augmented and virtual reality, as well as other digital technologies, that may somehow in the uh, other most general consumption uh, of the space of the memorial. Uh, for example, the, 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 the artist Shapira in 2017 did this project, the Holocaust, where did uh, uh, merge to picture of uh, people doing uh, more general, more uh, consumption of space, like sport, like selfie, like uh, running and so on and so forth and associated with actual picture from uh, from the holocaust in order to create this kind of uh, uh, opposition between uh, what the monument actually represents and the actual sentiment of mourning that you should have and on the other hand what uh, actually people do today so definitely uh, this kind of project like uh, smartphone apps augmented reality virtual reality also digital signals can definitely create uh, uh, learning opportunities in order to um, uh, frame and reframe uh, the, the meaning and interpretation and practices around the monuments and memorial space. Uh, very quickly, um, Estonia is really an example of, uh, uh, of what can be done in, uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, digital solution for, uh, for, uh, uh, for cultural heritage. Uh, in, in my book, I actually present a trajectory of cultural invention that goes from removal and relocation, but this, we already spoke about this uh, uh, this morning, until uh, building new monuments through a top-down approach first, and then engaging public opinion later, then building urban decoration, and definitely a, a fifth step can be you know, the uh, digitalization of uh, uh, Estonian cultural heritage. And in this respect, the approach that I use in the book, uh, connecting semiotic and cultural geography, can definitely be expanded to cultural heritage and its digital dimension. So the, the aim is to explore the meaning making and interpretation of cultural heritage, at least the material one, in a given cultural context beyond the only aesthetic, commemorative and celebratory aspect alone. In this case, I do use, uh, uh, I tend to, to, to make more uh, participative, uh, some category, quoting uh, indeed the, the moderator of, of uh, this panel, uh, Professor Palucci, between uh, uh, the first interplays between the plastic figure and political dimension, the second one between designer and user, the third one is between cultural heritage artifacts and the cultural context, the fourth one is between cultural heritage and the rest of the built environment, and then of course we can expand that to uh, the, the old uh, built environment. Today we are particularly lucky because this uh, mm, uh, uh, theoretical model definitely is uh, was uh, very much influenced by founding fathers of semiotics that are actually from 
the city that uh, uh, today's celebration is, is somehow unified in, uh, in, in another way. So it's needless to say for me now and not spending time how much is, uh, can be important to analyze the cultural aspect uh, of the indeed cultural heritage through uh, uh, ideas of textual interpretation of Umberto Eco, the idea of encyclopedia and uh, uh, encyclopedic competencies, uh, the idea of a semiosphere by uh, Yuri Lopman, uh, as well as uh, the category center and periphery. So, and uh, with the, with this, uh, I uh, definitely thank you, and I hope that there will be enough time to uh, discuss uh, all our interesting paper today. Thank you very much. Thank you for being just a little time and for leaving a little bit of more room to the discussion. So I would ask Marek, Francesco and Mario to take place in the three chairs remaining. Uh, and then we have, uh, I would say, 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes uh, before the vice rector comes um, and we start the last part of our, uh, of our program. Uh, I'm pretty sure that about intervention, questions and all that, so feel free to, to ask uh, to, our, to our speakers. Who wants to start? Marco, come. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your talks. Um, I, I had a question for my time about uh, digital history and digital memory, but actually after I heard uh, Mario and Francesco's speech, I uh, realized that it was maybe more <laughs> a question for them. So uh, it's for everyone really. Um, I, I read uh, Andrew Hoskins' book about digital memory and I really enjoyed it. Even if I have some questions about his um, relations to the German theory of media studies, because Ernst and all of that area of media studies have a strong, uh, I think, ontological theory of media, which can, re can lead to uh, technological determinism. So uh, the, the ontological structure of media determines our practices and so on and so forth. And so I'm not very much convinced on how that can be integrated into a, a semiotic framework, uh, whereas uh, the theories of modes of sign production that uh, Paolo was referring to before, I think that it could be maybe more useful because it uh, leaves room for the symbolic mediation and so it can help us also understand maybe better all, all of the uh, digital memory practices and so on and so forth. So maybe uh, uh, yeah, a priority on the symbolic mediation over the, uh, the ontological structure of media uh, that can help us also understand the material agency of, of media. And yes, I also had a question for Paolo, but I don't see him anymore, so maybe... Uh, he's, he's, on, he's moving, he's on the train, so he's going to connect... Uh, okay, so maybe, connect him maybe, maybe later. So maybe later you can ask him. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe we could collect more questions in 10 minutes. Please. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so I had two questions. First to Mark. So you talked about the technologies of history. And so we, we know that there has been historical novel already in the 19th century, then film in the 20th century. And very similar arguments have been made against them that Carlo uh, Ginsburg uh, made against the, uh, the games. For example, in the case of Schindler's List, the same thing. It's like intellectually simplistic and, and banal and uh, also politically dangerous because it represents this narrative of, uh, of um, uh, escape and, and uh, Western savior, so, so to say. So I wonder to what extent uh, so this, this digital turn is specific and new and to what extent it actually uh, um, changes the regimes of the regime of historicity, because it it, it will be the video, the video games will be just one one aspect that influences our uh, historical imagination. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where the the change of regime is. And the second question is actually to both of the, these presentations. Uh, about the minority, uh, I guess, about the peripheries or minorities. In, uh, when you said that video games are like uh, 
highlighting this military aspect of the past. So what about the women? I didn't see any women in uh, in the video game. So are we? Is it is this a return to masculinist history or? And in your case, I wasn't sure if you had just these two um, uh, corpuses, the Yugoslavian war and the Ukrainian Russians, because um, if so, so it gives the impression that only in like that. Uh, these beasts in the East have this nationalist history where each nation kind of tells a story in its own way, whereas we in the West are like um, more or less agree on what, what what happened in the past. So do you have a, uh, so just uh, questioning your choice of case studies? Yes. Thanks. Thank you, please. <laughs> Okay, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I know. Yeah. No, no problem. Uh, so thank you very much. First of all, it was um, very interesting for me to listen to this. I'm not uh, a specialist in digital things, so I learned a lot. But I wanted to ask about the, the possibilities and the limits of this kind of approaches uh, to all of you, actually. Um, so one uh, thing is about uh, what you uh, thought about uh, uh, participatory uh, possibilities, uh, the user, the centrality of the users, uh, and uh, of this uh, uh, co production of this um, uh, new kind of digital uh, ways of uh, um, remembering or of uh, rethinking the heritage. Um, so what about the algorithmic you know, nature of this um, way of, um, um, of thinking, of, of getting access so, to data? So, so what about so the, the, the distinction between, on the one hand, this participatory and users uh, and the centralized of the user, but on the other hand, this very uh, kind of predetermined patterns that the algorithm uh, creates in this kind of environments. And, uh, and the other thing, uh, uh, I guess it's more to, to Paolo, but I um, uh, think we're starting to think, uh, to reflect about it. So, um, so for me, uh, the possibility of uh, a digital you know, world is first of all related to the democratization of assets, to data, to information, the possibility of sharing so freely so, uh, materials. But now I understand that uh, the NFT logic and the metaverse logic is uh, to reproduce into this uh, digital environment the same kind of economic logic of, of, of a real world. So ownership, uh, uh, restricted assets, uh, and uh, so uh, payments, and uh, so I mean, buying pieces of this uh, metaverse as we buy pieces of, of this world. And then my question is, <laughs> what is the difference, and, <laughs> and should we not uh, stand for uh, the digital world as it is, or uh, maybe some development of, of the digital world as it is, which is, I mean, I'm not saying that there is no, there is a lot of uh, I mean, capitalist logic already there, but, uh, but still stand for these uh, more open possibilities and more uh, democratic possibilities. Yeah. Oh, there are, of course, risks. So, as we heard, the loss of this uh, authentici authenticity or unicity of this uh, pieces, of work, work of art, of other pieces of painting. We should okay. start, start answering, because okay. we'll forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if I. Yeah, start with reflect. I mean, these are all very excellent questions and comments. Uh, first, personally, I considered my uh, contribution as building up a conceptual toolbox to make sense of this digital historicity. And in this respect, I try to be as comprehensive as possible. And therefore, I believe that we need both this kind of material and symbolic uh, aspect of this uh, digital historicity and, and the both the, the technological infrastructure 
that is necessary part of this digital historicity, but also all the symbolic communication involved. Therefore, I don't see kind of that we have to choose. And and as I think, uh, yes, he quoted this article of of, of Ida Kikos and, and Mario Oyama, who explicitly tried to combine cultural semiotics and media, media archaeology, and that really this is actually the most fruitful way to, to have this kind of synthesis instead of you know choosing one or the other way. Uh, as to the uh, I mean, let's say the, you know, the, what's new about digital history, historicity, and of course it, it's a very good question. And personally, I would like to avoid this idea that digital condition is something completely new. I'm very much for continuation, but however, I believe there are some qualitative changes. And of course, it's always very difficult to judge one's own time. You can tell, as Carlos said, distance to say whether there is indeed something completely different. Uh, but, but they're both, there's some continuities, and also I do agree that, that all technological innovations bring along certain mental or symbolic changes, and digital technology is not an exception. But yeah, my state will, my position still is that, that the, the, the transformations that the social, cultural, symbolic transformation that digital technology brings along are significantly uh, uh, radical to consider that they give birth to this new digital condition and this new uh, uh, digital historicity. I do agree with you that, uh, that in this respect, I'm also a bit distant uh, from Darwin's book's criticism. I don't think I'm actually, I don't know, uh, terribly worried about the, the negative consequences of this digital condition. Of course, we should always be aware of possible risks. And, and actually, my intention was to, again, to be better aware what the consequences will be and how we should deal with them, how we should analyze them. And, and in this respect, it was like the first part of a, of a project, first to describe what's going on and to provide concepts to make sense of what's going on. And then in the second step, probably start, you know, having more critical, analytical attitude uh, and what can be used and what should be probably avoided or, or even, I don't know, uh, forgotten, if, if, I, if I may say so. And, and finally, just a note, a footnote to this tension between uh, participatory uh, culture and, and uh, creativity vis-a-vis -vis of algorithms and of course there is a tension indeed and that's probably one of the structural elements of this new digital condition there is a certain kind of tension between uh, this kind of automatized mechanism of, of, of digital condition and then of this idea of, of participation co-creation uh, interactivity etc but the algorithms uh, can be very adaptive and very you know indeed uh, also too creative and, and actually this is also something I was thinking about when listening to, to, to your talk uh, and Mario that actually these intertexts and, and, and prototexts are highly individualized mm -hmm. and these algorithms propose different uh, contexts and evidence for different users and this is one of the examples how actually you know malleable of, of, of yeah. what these uh, algorithms can be so they have certain, I would say, pressure on one's freedom, but on the other hand, this pressure is so flexible and, and you might even not notice it. Uh, so again, it's, 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 both sides are important, but we shouldn't consider algorithm as something very rigid and very, very sort of, uh, yeah, totally easy, easy, even more dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> true. But probably, yeah. Can I just like, can I just follow up with a small uh, question? Okay, you right. We were just yeah. saying. Because yeah, think, come here because uh, online participants yeah. are not want to. Okay, you can hear me? <laughs> I mean, that, you should ask me. <laughs> oh, okay, yes. No, just a small comment about what you were saying because I think your approach to digital historicity, um, maybe I misunderstood, but maybe you can clarify mm -hmm. that. It comes out of a fear of the, let's say, the kind of the impact of digitality mm -hmm. in the past or how the past actually is changed or ideas about mm -hmm. our past are changed through mm -hmm. the digitization and i know that you focus your talk on western context of digitization 
However, I would like to ask you maybe to think about this uh, problematic, which is actually involves other societies which actually do not have the access, accessibility or even the tools for digitization. So how can we actually think about a more inclusive approach that embodies, let's say, people or nations or states that don't have access to that, to that uh, uh, digital tools or even um, uh, kind of elements there? But also, uh, don't forget that most of our digitized works actually belong to large institutions who are actually are subsidized either by governments or have enough money or funding to do that. While actually many of these memorial spaces or organizations like smaller ones, still very much even within the European context, they don't have their material or archives digitized. So how do we deal with that kind of problem? Uh, just very briefly, that, uh, yeah, I do agree, but I would emphasize the fear. I mean, I'm not feared by this digital impact in our sense of, of history, but I do I, uh, admit that there is some changes due to this digital technology our, of our sense of historicity. But also I do agree that we should be more comprehensive, more global, but um, I, I, would, I would to say that there's not that many countries left actually in the world that are not under the direct and, and, and major impact of digital technology. Even the most poorest countries are very addicted to smartphones and, 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 and YouTubes and other kind of digitally mediated world. Uh, so, so I do agree that we, you should pay attention to differences, but there is any corner in the world which is not affected by this digital condition, but just to a different extent. But of course, as also uh, Daniele just said before, that this new digital world is as unequal as the old analog one. And we should also pay attention that on these power relations and, and economic relations. And, and I do agree the metaverse might become exactly as bad world as the current one. But it's made up to us what kind of metaverse we will be living. Yeah, very quickly. Yes. Uh, Marco, your question, yes, you're right. Uh, I completely agree, and this is why I marked uh, this difference that I was talking about this new ontology of memory uh, it talks about. And uh, I was saying that we are more interested in the process of textualization of these new object, objects. Still, I think that uh, somehow see, there is this risk of uh, technology determining determinism also in our skills. But when it talks of new ontologies, it talks of new, uh, new social objects like in the Okay, we are uh, semioticians, so we are allergic to ontology in the schools. I remember Apollo family, we are talking of ontology. <laughs> but in this sense, uh, ontology is, uh, means that really this ethics. Uh, just to describe this new ecology of media in which new, new social objects uh, about memory are appearing. And so the duty of the semiotics, uh, I think, is to try to deconstruct or to see how these new objects are, um, are textualized and what new products of semiotization are at uh, stake. But I mean, sometimes in Austria there is this risk of the term. Yeah, the question of the very quickly the purpose. No, it's not uh, orientalism. <laughs> it's not about that. It, it was like, uh, I mean, I, I know very well the Yugoslav case study because of the work I studied for some years. And we were discussing with Mario, and uh, we agreed that somehow, I mean, I mean, the current conflict is very interesting because it is the first social. Uh, social media, the, the first uh, conflict broadcast through social media. Yugoslav wars that were mm, that, that other major conflict of the last century, uh, the end of the last century is also very interesting because in that uh, wars there was a proliferation of audiovisual materials produced by the same perpetrators. So we have a lot of archival audiovisual materials. We don't have we, we don't have Nazis filming uh, uh, what were, they were doing in Auschwitz. That's a problem. We have just four images. Uh, uh, the Huberman wrote an entire book about these four images. That's everything we have about uh, what was made by, uh, from, by perpetrators in Auschwitz. We have a lot of audiovisual material on, uh, in Yugoslav wars. We have a lot of audiovisual material in this current conflict. 
they are abused and these texts are very different under many points of view. So this is why we are interested in this comparison. So it's not, it's not the, uh, that the uh, Eastern countries are taught to nationalism in a different way of, of uh, Western countries, but also I forgot <laughs> there was something very good I was about to say. But, uh, and, uh, um, do you want to add something? No, no, about this idea of the corpus. Also, uh, the idea is not to portray it like the, the two different sides in that specific area. We are not just considering like comment by Russians or comment by Ukraine. Comment. We are considering also in a translational perspective because the idea is to consider where these echo chambers are created, but maybe also Americans or European or Western European people can comment and also uh, belong to this uh, different uh, arena that are in opposition inside. The, the digital part of the fair considering. But the very Eastern is that's very interesting for our, our opinion to compare this to the world. Mm -hmm. More than, uh, for example, Georgian war, we don't have this proliferation of this likely answer for, uh, for this one. It's maybe we are wrong, and actually we were discussing here what's up, maybe we should uh, consider it not a large corpus, but examples. For example, the, the, the example of the Israeli Palestinian uh, uh, video and uh, response to uh, very interesting. So, there are different. Uh, of course, we are interested in digital battlefields, so we are interested when we have the competing narratives. And this is the reason. The algorithm, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I agree with you about the problem in activity. Uh, I mean, I still think that uh, the debate about uh, apocalyptic and the gratitude of people in power and people against is always uh, coming in different forms. And now we have, uh, uh, now of course, uh, the new media are uh, trying, it's good that we have seen. Right. But I would assume a more a more uh, moderate <laughs> position, not because of, not because I like moderate position, but I think that somehow uh, yes, I see the risk of what the, this book is talking about, and I can agree, of course. Uh, but I wouldn't be too judgmental because when you mention the Schindler list, okay, well, I thought that you were saying something. Okay, it's like a movie, no? It's like uh, uh, not in a negative sense because, of course, uh, I mean there are different forms of textuality uh, and different levels and different uh, translation, and so I'm not uh, so worried about the concern about the fact that the historical discourse find different translation. But he said, was the, 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 the example you made actually talk about uh, Assassin's Creed, because actually true that Notre Dame de Paris was, uh, they found information about the safety of the libraries in that video game. So the problem is, uh, I think, for digital archive is this problem. In a physical archive, the original document, the material document was preserved. Now, what, what's this information that is preserved, where, under what form? So, how we are sure that uh, that uh, uh, binary coding of that uh, uh, architectonic uh, state of Notre Dame was authentic? Uh, how can we be sure of authenticity of the document? Of course, there is a lot, there is a big debate, and also on which we'll talk and are part of this other story. But I think. It, this is interesting about the nature of what uh, is the document, what, what, what's, 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 what is coming to the, what is, uh, how the document is transforming through the digitization. So, thank you, Federico. Just uh, very briefly on uh, on, on Daniele's uh, comment, uh, and, and as you know, uh, algorithms are made by humans, and I really think that you know uh, they. Uh, develop on the horizon of the humans, so they include the biases that we have in terms of gender, in terms of uh, ethnicity and so on and so forth. The problem possibly is the scale, but you know, also I, I tend to agree on the call not to fear much of uh, Mark Tam because actually, you know, the, the, uh, sometimes there are those narratives, you know, this kind of uh, Asimov-like narratives of, you know, machine are coming and taking us and so on and so forth, as if the reality would be actually better. No? So if you want, they are both very nice or both very bad. It depends from uh, either you are uh, optimistic or less. Uh, I think that definitely if we can somehow uh, provide certain kind of solution, we definitely can start from 
human intelligence rather than artificial one from personal memory rather than me memory of uh, digits so to make for example social media connect uh, actually personal memories rather than pixel and at least to have this in mind while designing solution can be somehow helpful just a quick comment so thank you very much to all of you, to all the questions of the participants and all that. I've seen now our vice rector of uh, P week. So uh, thank you once again for the intervention. So I personally uh, say a big thank you to Rafaela Campaner, who is our vice rector for international relations. Uh, so I'm asking, no, Marek, you can stay here because we have a kind of uh, ceremonial involving Patrizia Violi, Costantino Marmo and Daniele Monticelli. Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, no? I would say not. So Daniela, yeah, Daniela. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, asked Daniel to come. So I leave room to all of you uh, and for Raffaella, which is who is connected for that. Good evening. Okay. Uh, do we need to go to the other side? What's the other No, Okay. No, yes. 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 Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear yep. me okay? Okay, so thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me just to say a few short remarks tonight. I would like to thank all the people present there, so colleagues, friends, um, uh, people who are participating to this event. So I'm really glad to be here tonight with, with sort of you virtually. I do apologize. I couldn't be there in presence because I'm in Padua right now, we have the Coimbra group meeting, but I am sort of with you in, in any case. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you both in my capacity of the Vice Rector for International Relations and I must say also as a person working in the humanities. Uh, I'm very glad to be uh, with you because this is a very important moment insofar as we are sort of celebrating the agreement between the Center Umberto Eco the School of Humanities of Tallinn University. So the center is for its very uh, vocation, always engaged in promoting fostering exchanges concerning interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary topics. And through them, through such a intense and continuous research uh, work, also promoting exchanges and collaborations with a number of very important partners, both within Italy and abroad. So the, the vocation of, as I was saying, the center uh, is very multidisciplinary. And likewise, the statement of the School of Humanities in Tallinn University, I'm just quoting it from the website itself, offers to all students and to Estonian society in general, knowledge mm -hmm. and competence related to different languages, world views and cultural traditions. So, in a sense, it's a sort of ideal uh, combination of views and enhancement of uh, growing knowledge uh, through the, the, the interpretation and sharing of differences and intersection of worldviews. So, no doubt, this is going to be a very fruitful collaboration, a very fruitful uh, agreement, and I'm looking forward to the fruits of such a, an important interaction between the Centre and Tallinn University. Thanks a lot. Well, I don't know if there is any order in which we could intervene, but maybe uh, Daniele would like to start first. Oh yes, I think we didn't look like the four months, so like we haven't prepared anything, so yeah, we will simply react. react. So what we are going first of all from thank you uh, for this wonderful event. I think it was a very important and very nice way to launch uh, cooperation, which actually already developed in a more kind of 
no, I wouldn't say underground, but still not visible way, you know, but still prove uh, uh, application that we did for a project and in many also uh, um, application projects, actually. Um, we together with some of us are doing together and meetings in the different conferences and different panels. Um, so I think um, we are very um, happy and uh, um, it's very important for us to um, have this agreement. I mean, Bologna, of course, is the oldest university in the world. It's um, a very important reference point for all of us and uh, and um, uh, the, I think these two um, intellectual figures of Umberto Eco and Yuri Lottman uh, who, um, had in many ways a lot in common, but uh, uh, could not uh, uh, develop a, a closer relation because of, of the Iron Curtains, which uh, divided uh, two parts of Europe and, and uh, I think we are all very, we feel all the responsibility now for uh, continuing uh, this dialogue uh, now that we have all the possibilities so to meet and uh, both virtually and, uh, and uh, in presence. So I think I just to say that uh, you are all very welcome in Tallinn next year. We cannot say still the date uh, because we will think about it together with you, of course. And um, good luck to, to all of us for developing this, with this agreement in many different directions and um, with many different initiatives and involving both. Uh, more experienced and uh, senior scholars, but also, and I think most importantly, uh, younger uh, ones who are future as we know. Thank you very much. Yes, as, as Patricia said in the morning, this solemn moment has a long history started more than three years ago and and so it's truly nice to be finally physically in Bologna after all these preparations and and the after the, the the agreement was signed already more than a year ago but then but then it's happened and, and we have to cope with these unexpected um, uh, events uh, there is a, a metaphor that uh, was particularly dear to Umberto Eco, namely this metaphor dating back to the 12th century. We are just dwarfs uh, standing on the shoulders of the giants. And as you know, the quote continues, and therefore we see better, we see farther. And I think this is our attitude, and, and it should be that Eco and Lopman are kind of two giants. And we are those dwarfs on the shoulders of these giants. But thanks to this, that we are on the shoulders, we can see better and we can see uh, farther. So I hope that we will be able to, to, you know, work on this very important intellectual legacy of these two great thinkers. So used to be also close friends, and that we can actually go and we can go beyond it. We can go farther. We can continue this work in this very good uh, spirit of, of of collaborations. And it was my first time to be in Bologna, um, but I feel that uh, this is my very fresh impression that, that Bologna and Tallinn are very close to each other in many respects. I mean, they are the kind of historic atmosphere that is in the town, and they're almost on the equal size of these two towns. And so we are very proud of this cooperation. And I, I um, also have to uh, transmit the excuses from our uh, director of the School of Humanities, Fuku uh, who was not able to join us, as it was planned in the beginning. <laughs> that I know that he is particularly happy about this co uh, cooperation because, to be honest, this is one of the very unique agreements we have signed. Because normally it always is organized within the framework of Erasmus agreements or this kind of vision and partnership. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first bilateral uh, agreement of cooperation between 
and where we have at the School of Humanities in Tallinn University. So, so indeed, this is you know something important, and special, and we are very glad. And as Daniel said, we hope to see you next time in, in Tallinn. Thank you very much. And just a very few words, first of all, because I wouldn't be able to say more because of my voice, but then everything has been said already. I said something this morning and <coughs> explained very well the meaning and the sense and the engagement that this agreement implied, uh, which is not only a, a Asmus exchange, which is very important and very interesting, but this is more focalized on research, certainly, and on the group of, of two centers, uh, which will be the ideal depository. So far, we are ideal, but we will become very tough of the heritage of two important persons like Lotman and Eko. Uh, as uh, I remember that we started uh, discussing this matter in 2019 when I was invited in Tallinn and I suggest that we absolutely had to, to mm -hmm. make more solid and permanent our uh, common interest in the archive. And then, you know, the COVID uh, stopped all actions well, time goes on, so I, when I suggested that, I was at the time director of the center, then times goes on, so I stopped being director, but Constantino Mago took over and the project went on. But I would like to, here to, I owe a special thanks to one person in this process, who is Francesco Mazzucchelli, because I know very well how how much care it takes to go through all the bureaucratic uh, steps to finish an agreement. I don't know if it's the same for you, but in Bologna it takes a lot. A lot of patience, a lot of work, a lot of care. And since care is not one of the most noticeable feature of males, especially <laughs> of Italian males, I was particularly moved by the fact that Francesco put a lot of care in doing that. So thanks to him, and we are here to festejare this union. And uh, uh, we don't have a bottle of champagne. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think about that. But thank you, for Patrizia, and I want to thank you, uh, Francesco, too, because I, I know he followed through all the process of uh, of uh, signing the the agreement uh, and uh, also i want to thank patricia who took uh, the the first step <laughs> uh, in the past and the colleagues from from uh, Tallinn university who were so who fostered really the <clears throat> The, this achievement, and I want to thank Mario uh, also for uh, and Francesco for the organization of this of this conference that uh, shows exactly uh, how close we we are and we can be, and uh, and so uh, because it's a very good step I think uh, uh, today for the discussion for the presentations and uh, very interesting indeed and. Um, and uh, I hope it, we will be able to go on, on this way. And just as we began with the coordination of uh, Charles the uh, Fifth, and I didn't say this morning that after the coordination, both uh, <clears throat> both the parades uh, joined together and went through the Via Clavature to celebrate <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so. <clears throat> We are, doing, we are doing more or less the same uh, because uh, this is uh, the time no one has to be abandoned. <laughs> uh, it was a uh, saying in, in Latin poetry, and uh, I, think, I think even if we don't have a button here, uh, later on <laughs> there will be one. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, see you next time.
Grazie Raffaella. Grazie. Okay. 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 Okay